Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's great to have you with us. I have with me on the panel tonight Jasmine Dillon, the President of Rotary South Bank, and Stuart MacArthur, the Secretary of South Bank Rotary. So uh, they're our panellists for tonight. Welcome, everyone. Firstly, and obviously, very importantly, I want to acknowledge the Noongar Wajuk people who are traditional custodians of the land on which I'm hosting this webinar acknowledge the strength of their continuing culture and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Jasmine and Stuart tonight. A Satellites to Success has been a little while in, in the making. I think Jasmine and I were discussing this about oh, sometime last year, probably nine, ten months ago, but I'm really pleased that it's come to fruition. Now, introducing our panellists, Jasmine is the current president of the Rotary Club of South Bank, which all you 9800s would know is the home club of district governor, Philip Archer. Jasmine's a lawyer who uh, works across a range of specialty, uh, criminal, family, and immigration. But Jasmine is really passionate about being of service to the community and having a positive impact on the lives of other people. She loves the four-way test. Uh, service above self attitude is what really appeals to her about Rotary, and she likes to apply that to her daily life and professional life. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to President Jasmine Dillon of the Rotary Club of South Bank. Over to you, please, Jasmine. Thank you, Kira. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share about the satellite clubs that we've created over the last 12 months at the Rotary Club of South Bank. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And also thank you to Stuart MacArthur, the secretary of our club, who's had a really big year at a district level and at our club within our club and the satellite clubs as well. And he'll also be part of tonight's discussion. So, so it's been really fantastic to be here and to share what we've been doing over the past 12 months. So there's, over the past 12 months, two satellite clubs have been created. One was in June of 2020 and the other one was in this year. It's, it's definitely a challenging time to have created satellite clubs then in that we were in lockdown for the majority of this last year in Victoria. Uh, but it's also offered a way for um, these new members to stay connected and engage with each other as well. So that's also been a positive for them. So we all know there's been a, uh, dwindling numbers in Rotary for some time now. One part of that is an ageing population in general, but also uh, just seeing people quite busy, I guess, and over overworked in many ways. and sometimes finding it their time poor to actually connect and do more outside of work. And that's one of the reasons that the satellite clubs were created, to cater to a demographic of people who have an interest in giving back and doing, and doing good and making contribution, but they're really time poor, whether it's because there are millennials who, and millennials is a very wide term. It ranges from around 23 to 38, so it's a very wide term that's used. And... And then you've got the CEO club who are also very time poor, probably at the peak of their, their careers and really balancing lots of commitments and commitments and opposing interest in time and how they spend their time with family and their career. So the first club we created, the Satellite Club, was in June of 2020, and that's the Millennial Satellite Club. And that was for a demographic of young people who basically are very time poor and want to give back. They're juggling uni, work, friends, social life, and really want to give back but don't know how to. A lot of them had never heard of Rotary or had very basic awareness and knowledge and effectively were looking for a way that they could contribute. Some of them were people we already knew and some of them were new people who had never engaged at all and some of them actually came from people who were interested and shared what the satellite club was about and what rotary was about but the main thing is that they wanted flexibility to do things on their own terms and they wanted to have projects that might not be something a traditional club would take on so the great thing about the satellite millennial club is we really focused on what rotary can offer them and really focused on reframing what Rotary was about in that it's about, you know, um, being service above self and the world's largest volunteer organisation. 
but it was really empowering them to be leaders. And they see themselves as leaders already, not emerging leaders. The benefits we offered and put out to them to target them to come on board and, and, and effectively then taking up Rotary membership was that they would be mentored and they'd be mentored by an experienced Rotarian to ensure they're still operating within the frameworks of Rotary. And then also they were mentored by a business leader. So in this case, their first mentor was a Melbourne City Councillor. And they got a lot out of it, you know, having that Rotary perspective, having someone from the business and community that's outside of Rotary as well, being one of their mentors. So this was an opportunity for them to get more professional development. And all of them also were effectively given a position on the board. So they really uh, got out getting and got a lot out of it. And also, of course, from adding to our volunteer capacity and, and being part of the wider club where, where they can be. But the, the main thing was that they were keen. They didn't really fit the mould of what they felt the, um, the actual main club was. And perhaps even they wanted to create their own culture and feel like they're in a startup and entrepreneurial and could really decide which direction their, their projects would go in. And they brought diversity. They brought diversity of age, life experience. Some are from different types of minority groups across the spectrum and they brought fresh ideas and a lens that's really just free and innovative and of course a lot of the ideas had to be very much tweaked up and and kind of re reframed but it was just fantastic and it brought lots of invigoration to the club to learn about what they were thinking about doing and their ideas so that's the millennial club and we're looking to hope, we're hoping for them to grow this year. They've really missed that face-to-face -face connection and ability to do social events as they had some amazing ideas to do some really large events, which had to be put on hold several times. But we're hoping in the new year, some of those initiatives will be actualized. As for the CEO club, that was repositioned to appeal to these senior business leaders who had previously been approached and from my understanding, I, I was told something along the lines of around 90% of senior business leaders tend to decline the offer, opportunity to join Rotary because they can't commit to a weekly meeting, uh, whether that be a morning breakfast meeting, lunch meeting, dinner meeting. They prefer, well, in this case for our side of the light club, to meet monthly. And uh, the benefit for them, which was sold, and of course, these are all people with similar values to Rotary members in, a, in, the, in our main Rotary Club. But what was sold to them really was reframing the offering that they can network with other leaders in their field in this more flexible arrangement versus a weekly meeting. And they could really focus and work on projects that are part of their business environment and what they perceive to be societal issues and also to really do it at a very high level so a lot of these people would be sitting on boards already. However, they're doing it at a high level by way of wanting to have an influence on, and although, of course, Rotary is non-political, but they want to have an influence where they can on some policy issues. And they also want to um, create projects, but maybe also do it in a more low-key environment, but tapping into the Rotary's um, larger global network. So there's been a lot of benefits and everyone who that benefit was put to words as to the global network that Rotary provides and the, and the larger network, they were really keen to leverage that and to contribute and make an impact where they could, but in the areas they're very passionate about and have a lot of experience in. And um, we've seen some really great collaboration in that club and they've got a few projects underway and mental health is the space as well, with one of the members being a senior professor in that space. So um, they've been working quite diligently to put some um, to to make more of an impact and be seeing more of that the projects and as they're finalised in the new year. Let's get some water. So basically, this uh, concept of creating the satellite clubs has meant that we've been able to grow the membership base and also diversify the membership by way of diversity of age, life stage, 
even mostly importantly with these members, like diversity of thought, as they're all very different people who most of them have not previously been part of a larger organisation, like a volunteer organisation or not-for-profit. So they're really bringing a different lens to one of the really entrepreneurial, innovative in the initiatives they take on and are really making some great progress in that space. So, yeah, I think that's probably in a nutshell really the rationale and the differences in the two CEO, CEO and the Millennial Satellite Clubs. And the main thing is that, you know, Rotary has a great offering and a lot of us have come to Rotary because of friends. We've met people or we've grown up in it. Have a lot of these people, as I mentioned, have not had any connection, might have heard of Rotary, but they've never had any engagement. Some of the CEO club members have. They've been actively, you know, sponsoring and donating, but they just hadn't had any hands-on in involvement or any way of contributing to the ideas that and projects that are taken on and initiatives. So, yeah, we've found that these two clubs have added lots of value to our main club and where possible, we obviously are one group team, one club and collaborate if it's appropriate. However, these two are standalone, importantly, and they chart their own course of what suits them on their terms when it comes to meeting times, the fee structure and the projects that they're passionate about that and want to take on. So I'll hand over to Stuart who um, will talk a bit about the practicalities of the setup of these two clubs for anyone who's got any interest about the nitty-gritty aspects of, of it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Jasmine, I mean, uh, I'm sure you, you're all aware. I mean, diversity is, is always a, has always been a part of Rotary ever since day one, and of having the opportunity of having multiple clubs within a club does create the opportunity to get different perspectives, different types of people, be it on a different night or a different location, with a different demographic. and to do different projects. Obviously, every member of all the satellite clubs are ultimately a member of the one club. The idea of a satellite club, although new, is probably not all that different to what other clubs may have done in the past to create different experiences. So Stuart's been fantastic and he's also played a mentoring role with the um, members of our Millennial Club and he's been really important in helping them to agree with the fee structure they're comfortable with and amending the bylaws accordingly and our constitution as um, he's um, fantastic with all of the technical, even our IT. He's created a standalone website and web page on our website for the Millennials. So he's done a, a fantastic job there. But as Stuart... Yeah saying really people might say well, why not um, join a Rotaract club or how about everyone just fit into one club but the reality is there's different cultures at every club there's different cultures um, everywhere but we've all got the same underpinning values and um, some of our millennials for example feel more comfortable engaging with other peers of their own cohort and age as all of them haven't had professional experience and they might feel it a bit intimidating to deal with the with a regular Rotary Club has a very diverse age range, sometimes more on the senior side. And so it just fits them to have this space. It's a free space for innovation and thereby bringing diversity to, to the wider club. And we definitely like to draw on ideas wherever we can from all three clubs as we're all one club at the end of the day and we're all one Rotary at the end of the day. We're just different and not everyone fits the moulds in every way or haven't got the capacity to do a specific time and agenda effectively. Anything further to add there, Stuart? Absolutely. And, and what I know Rotary has been doing for many, many years is by creating new clubs, they meet at, at new times. It does has does and has always created that that diversity of of leadership. Now, to set up a 
brand new rotary club obviously takes uh, i think a minimum of 25 people um so it's obviously a, a daunting task to try and achieve but a satellite club only requires eight eight members under the leadership of a parent club over time that club may grow and ultimately become its own fully fledged rotary club in the future and people may transition between clubs too. That's so we right. We had some members who originally joined the Millennial Satellite Club and they thought they were better fit for the main Rotary South Bank Club. As you know, everyone's different at every age and every stage and it's about giving people options to choose what fits them best and hence still want to attract them and, and some capacity and keep them connected to Rotary. That's right. And depending on how, how your clubs want to work, I mean, it, it's possible to have them all fairly independent. They might have their own bank accounts and their own secretaries and treasurers. But then again, they we have one, one treasurer for, for all the clubs. It's a matter of adapting to your club and to your clubs and find something that works for you. Is it fair to say that, they, that one of the things that's really worked about this this tripartite arrangement is that the three entities have maintained or coordinated well to, and collaborated well together. How has that collaboration been facilitated? Absolutely. So they have regular meetings every month and a few of our members will attend different meetings. I've attended quite a few and Stuart's at pretty much all of them and we pass on information and there's a board meeting once a month normally and therefore there's a chair from each of the clubs so there's a chair from the CEO satellite club there's a chair from the millennial club and they represent those organizations and feedback information to us and any questions and there's always an open channel for emails and that and initially in the, in the early days the millennial club was full of questions and <laughs> others were constantly trying to assist and give them some further knowledge and how this is done and outside of the mentors they already have so um, it's definitely about keeping open communication and having a chair for each of the satellites to feed back to the board and so everyone's aware of where everyone's at and can contribute and collaborate and connect where possible. Picking up on that issue with the millennials, I just happen to be, an, for my sins, an honorary member of Rotary of Elizabeth Key, which is a similar organisation, a young people's Rotary Club, which is going from strength to strength, aiming for 60 members this year, but past, already past 50. Would you think, and I've also heard others say that if I could get one or two young people into their club, it would do their traditional club a world of good. Just given the options of putting young people in penny packets around traditional clubs or keeping them together in one club, which do you see as the, the better way of getting young people into Rotary and why? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think any, of, the, any um, of that kind of option is better. It's just really about that individual and where they feel most comfortable and feel that they can express themselves and make the best contribution they can. So we've got some very mature millennials out there who are very, very comfortable dealing with people from all walks of life and who be more fitted into a the mainstream rotary club or potentially even the ceo club but there are others who are uni students and haven't really got that confidence but being part of the millennial club helps build that and they certainly get professional development experiences they get to rotate the chair position most importantly and the chair position is rotated every three months so everyone gets to build up that capacity when it comes to younger people joining clubs and certainly that's fantastic. However, you know, it really is about giving people op op options and seeing where they best fit. I mean, they might transition to different, different satellite clubs along the way. And some of these younger people who join sometimes feel they get put, so social media gets put onto them or certain roles that the millennials know how to do and, you know, become this innovative innovator. But really, um, a lot of them see themselves as leaders already, well, in our millennial satellite club, and they want that board position and they want to just be a full-fledged member. And the other benefit is that the governance aspect is outsourced. So we've got a secretary that oversees three of the three bodies 
and as well as the treasurer. So they don't have to do aspects of the uh, maintenance of the club that they're not really that interested in. They just want to kind of create the ideas and work on the projects. So the administration load on those satellites is, is reduced? Absolutely, yes. A question there from, I do have a number of other questions coming in. One there from Marion. What's the fee structure for the, for the three entities and how do you manage policy across the three clubs? I could probably add a few words around that one. Every club, as you know, has a constitution and a bylaws. When it comes to satellite clubs, everybody within the entire club and the satellite clubs has one single constitution. At the beginning of the constitution, it defines what the name of the club and clubs is. The individual satellite clubs can then create their own set of bylaws to relate those things that are special to that club. But ultimately, we have one constitution to everybody. Fair enough. So there is flexibility with the fee structure and each okay. that can agree on that. Yes. Great. So that's done in consultation between the three clubs? That's right. And obviously the parent club has the ultimate say to agree or, or disagree with any decision that the satellite club makes. Yes, and we're very fortunate that we, there was some sponsorship that helped subsidise the millennials this year. It was a hard time for COVID as well as, you know, a lot of them, some of them's pricing is a bit of a point that we see them not being able to join and pay the full membership. So there was some flexibility there as well. Ah, fantastic. Thanks, Jasmine. Another question this time from Josie. How do you handle a club within a club? Another good question. And, and actually, it's, it's the interesting one because I, I know I, I went along to an Australian Rotary conference a number of years ago and uh, and the, the, there was a concept fl floating around at that point, which is not altogether different from what I've heard many times before. And this was what was called a club in a club. And the biggest challenge in Rotary when you've got a club with a whole lot of older members and you, you bring in a single younger member, it's very hard to get them involved in the club. But if you bring in a whole lot of people at the same time and you give them a role to do, then you, you have a chance to, to keep them. And that's, I, I think it's the biggest hurdle I overcome. but still give them the, the flexibility and, and the leadership from the parent club to help them yes. uh, and, and, and guide and, them. Thank you, Stuart. That's fantastic. And as with every new organisation startup, there's always different iterations. You know, you learn as you go and there's always improvements and tweaks and changes to be done. But ultimately, everyone is there for the common good and have a uniting purpose. And we all want to see everyone succeed and contribute and, and make a difference and there's more hands for impact so ultimately we see ourselves as one rotary one south bank however different in a way by way of how we operate and in the times we meet and the projects we, we are interested in pursuing fantastic thank you jasmine and stuart uh, you've mentioned that you've your the chairs of your satellite attend your board meetings but are the satellite clubs formally represented on your board? Do they have a, have a vote and all that sort of thing? Yes, they do. Fantastic. Thanks, Stuart. And one from one from Di. Do satellite club members pay full RI and district dues? Once again, the answer to that is yes. So every member is ultimately a member of South Bank. So unless your district made different decisions that might apply to satellite clubs, then they would certainly pay exactly the same amount. Interestingly enough, I was at the Rotary Convention just the other day. I heard of one speaker with one new club. I think it was from Chile. Um, they, they're a group of young people. 
and pretty much all they charge is the cost of the RI subscription, the district dues, the magazine, and I think the cost of the website, and that's it. So yes, it can be minimised, which is particularly important for, for younger people, but then obviously you need to make up other costs in maps in, in any regular meeting fees that you might have or whatever. Fantastic. Thanks, Stuart. From Wayne, were all of the members of the original club happy with the starting of the satellite clubs? <laughs> well, um, from my recollection, yes. However, you know, there's all these different views on everything, right? There's sometimes people, even I've heard from different members outside of our club, some people don't see the benefit, you know, or they're just thinking, well, there's a really rotary and there's really a rotary club. Why can't people just be part of that, yeah? And that's a valid view for sure. However, it's just really about attracting people, diverse people who have different interests and selling them what Rotary can offer them in a way that really connects and resonates to them and that makes sense to them and where they spend their time and energy. So it's really just another marketing tool to attract more members and ultimately we've all got the same goal in mind. We all want to make a contribution. But of course there'll be people who'll think, what is that? Does it, what is the point? Like, is it creating something new for the sake of it or is it necessary? But it's really the point is that the people that we have in these satellite clubs wouldn't otherwise have joined our club, ultimately. So when it comes to membership growth, we all want that in our club. And in and yeah, fortunately everyone was very supportive and on board, at least at least they said they were. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were. <laughs> a question from Wayne. What type of group of people will the third satellite club be arranged around? <laughs> Good question. That's so <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I was just thinking about this this afternoon. Was it the um, <laughs> pet swans do it? No. No, yeah, I mean, I mean, Rotary is diverse and obviously the, the, there, are, there are lots of opportunities You all know that every, every club is different. I mean, it, it wouldn't be possible to set up a club of of legal people to take on certain challenges. It, it wouldn't be it would be it would be possible to to set up. I mean, there have been club, clubs set up in the past around. And there's a, a, a rotary club of wash for, um, for, for, for for water and, 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 and sanitation. So there are lots of different projects that, that will come across our our club as the years go ahead, and I'm sure there'll be opportunities to branch out into individual areas. And... Yeah, and on that note, I think it's really oh. about looking at what what um, who you want to attract and seeing what works for them. So the millennials, we definitely want to attract more millennials and do so in a way that felt safe and supported and saw the benefit. And the CEOs as well, we wanted to attract them who are otherwise time poor and just don't have the commitment to be able to do weekly meetings. So perhaps, I don't know, I think, could there be capacity to have a mum's club, a mum's satellite club? We've got toddlers and kids and they can uh, meet at coffee and or whatever suits their lifestyle potentially. So it's just really about seeing who's the demographic you want to attract and trying to tailor it to them and uh -huh. what are the barriers for them joining a regular Rotary Club. A question from Brian. How do you handle existing club members wanting to move to a satellite club? Yeah, we've, we've had a few moves actually. We have a couple. And it's totally supported because it's about where that person feels they can thrive the most and make the most impact. And one of our members transitioned to the CEO club as they felt it better suited them for the projects that they wanted to work on. And um, so it's totally supported and ultimately we're all still part of the same overall club. And I also look at more as a, a hybrid environment whereby you, you, you might have to get involved in two or three or four satellite clubs uh, in one way or another. So ultimately, we're all a team. South Bank could become the Rotary Club of Satellites. <laughs> <laughs>
but we do have more questions. One from Christina, and this is looking at the original aim of satellite clubs. Do you see your satellites chartering if they get to 20 members? Is that likely? Time will tell what exactly happens. I mean, there's, there's, there's a number of different scenarios I could see. I mean, and you, you might have a situation that a, a club gets big and goes off in its own way. You might even consider a possibility that a satellite club becomes comes big and and is a key part of the entire club and and then ultimately takes over the role of the, the parent club. Yes. And, uh, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. Exactly. On another note, you know, yeah. millennials aren't millennials forever. So of course they'll have they'll transition at some point. Whether they all grow up together though and feel like this is our uh, this is our club and we'll make it a charter club. But um if not, you know, they they most likely would transition and CEOs again, you know, when they're closer to having a more a different lifestyle again and can commit to more uh, hands-on activities, they might transition to a, a more, you know, regular Rotary Club. Mm. So it's really just open to transition or, but the idea is everyone has put out there that they, they also have the opportunity to charter in the future should they grow and, yeah, definitely. So it's a very healthy environment where rather than rather than holding on to members as though they as though they uh, they have no rights to move, South Bank is actually encouraging people to think about where in Rotary they they might get the best value. Exactly, and I also note note we've got we've got a couple of members, including the president of Rotary Club Melbourne, here tonight as well. And I know for over a number of years they. They've had not just a, a lunchtime meeting, but also an evening meeting as well. Um, so yes, it, it's a common theme, even though that might not be a, a satellite club, it does create multiple experiences. Right, thanks Stuart. One from our, uh, as, our Zone 8 uh, membership coordinator, Adrian. What's been the greatest challenge in starting these satellite clubs? Well, I mean, naturally, when you're people are attracted to Rotary um, to do to contribute. However, when it comes to millennials as well, people attracted to Rotary, you know, they're all leaders. The people who come, come to see your clubs, they're all leaders. I mean, everyone is a leader, but you're attracting people who are very much leaders <laughs> in every capacity of life. So there's always going to be, you know, a bit of, with every normal group, a bit of that forming, storming, norming, not exactly storming, but certainly trying to find your place and how you fit in and how you fit into the larger club but we're all quite you know supportive and mindful and give everyone the opportunity to to really express themselves and to put their hands up what they want to do and have that opportunity so they're all leaders but when you have many leaders together I mean we haven't had this experience with CEOs but with the millennials because they're younger they need mentoring certainly with lots of young leaders together it can be difficult to be like who's the chief and you know and even if someone is the chief just for that moment of having that position title there certainly can be some some aspects of there's cooperation but there's certainly some teething issues to work out so you'll get your turn you know you'll get your turn and kind of that yeah that was a challenge for us initially isn't that part of the learning process part of the development process for the people and the organization absolutely i mean it's uh, i mean certainly with with the millennials, it's obviously always a, always a challenge. I know from even my days in Rotaract that people come and go all the time. And I've seen a number of Rotary clubs over the years come and go. And it's, it's no different trying to form up a satellite club of millennials. We've had our challenges along the way. Um, and time will tell what ultimately happens. But we will, um, we, we will see. And I mean, it, it's really important that you listen to every member, in particular them. Make sure that everybody has a say and, and can contribute in, in their own way. The question about the mentoring arrangements, I mean, we traditionally tend to look at mentoring as being a something that happens in one direction. Are you seeing much in the way of two-way mentoring developing? Because obviously your young folk have 
different things to bring to the table that could in fact be very useful uh, to your more your senior members. Absolutely, we've seen that. We've seen that the millennials provide a lot of ideas and that whole two-way mentoring certainly has happened. Even with our previous mentor from Melbourne City Council, she had a lot of value provided and different ways of thinking from the millennials as well. And the idea is that that the satellite, the CEO club as well, will provide mentoring to the millennials. And we do have that um, that two mentors that are part of every millennial meeting, and then it shifted to every second. Um, so one experienced Rotarian, which we had Nick Kane on quite a while, and then we had the Melbourne City Councillor, who was a business mentor, and then Stuart's also been highly involved. So we've certainly all learned from each other and grown by the diversity of our ideas. And also interesting to note that we, we've even had a father and a son in our two satellite clubs. Fantastic, fantastic. Intergenerational stuff, great. Question from Bruce. Do the satellite clubs elect slash select their own leaders to coordinate their activities and meetings? Yes, again. Fantastic. And one from Adrian. What's been the most rewarding outcome during the forming of these clubs? I'd say the most rewarding outcome has been to see, I think they've really ignited a lot of passion into our club and really invigorated that. And really just made us remind ourselves why we're Rotarians and just sharing that experience with them and teaching them more about Rotary and see that interest grow in them too. I think it's just really been a bit of a refresher for us all and really to remind us what Rotary has to offer. <laughs> you know, so that's been it's been really rewarding to just refresh on that and share that and see people who otherwise would know nothing about Rotary, like a lot of them did not or had no kind of connection saying wow this is really awesome and really feel they're getting a lot out of it and it was also good good at, at, at our district conference just, just to see that the number of our, our south bank rotarians in, including members of both of both satellite clubs there that was really good thanks Stuart. a question and this is a question submitted by josie one question is, what's the importance of a memorandum of understanding and do you need one for a satellite? I don't, I don't, I don't think you need one. Um, obviously, if you had a separate organisation that you're in partnership with, um, then, then yes, yes you, you, you would do that. Examples are, I mean, obviously, Rotary International would have a memorandum of understanding with Shelterbox. If your club was working with another organisation, yes, yes, you would do that. But ultimately, in this case, they're all members of South Bank. They're all governed by the constitutions of the club. So, so that covers up all the requirements. Fair enough. Thanks, Stuart. Rotary Youth Programs. We have some absolutely fantastic youth programs, and I have in mind things like Ryla, Riley, Ryla Oceania. Have these being deployed, say, with your with your millennials satellite club. We've served. No, I'll let Stuart go. I guess we haven't got too much into that. I mean, we we have looked certainly looked at the various training options within within the district. And looked at trying to, in some cases, customise those for our, our millennials to to go and do them together. But yeah, it's. It's something that obviously, when when you get any new club forms, obviously you've got a lot, you've got a lot of new people. They need to learn more about Rotary. Club need needs to make sure that they they put appropriate time into teaching them about the various aspects of Rotary. Yes, and and just as noted before, so these are all young leaders. They're all, you know, quite successful in their own fields. One is on multiple committees at the Melbourne City Council level and across many different um, organisations and LGBTQ organisations and very much a leader. So they're all, they're all leaders and, they, and they've come with a common purpose and to also obtain value. However, really it's about really finding out what will work for them. We're not going to mandate or say they have to be part of anything. It's really what, what they're comfortable with and what fits them and, and their 
interests. However, we of course have always promote opportunities and experiences that can enrich them. Ultimately, you know, it's up to them to choose what really resonates when it comes to other professional development and, and opportunities and programs for youth. Fantastic. Thanks, Jasmine. Looking at your satellites and the broader network, one of the things that we really need to see happen more is for clubs to, to cooperate, uh, to collaborate together. So how do your satellites engage with other clubs in your district? Obviously, internally, it's very healthy. Yes, we certainly want to see more of that in the future. However, you know, given it's been a year of lockdown and COVID, there haven't really been that many opportunities um, as such besides them attending some meetings. However, our satellite club for millennials has been supporting the Campbellwell market for quite a few months now since uh, early, early this year, no, early last year, in fact. Where, where they just got on board with volunteering. And that was a wonderful opportunity that was brought to the club um, where they could volunteer there and make some ex- and raise some funds for the, uh, for the Millennial Club as well. So they did, they did get involved with that hands-on opportunity to assist at the Campbell Markets with, with the Rotary Clubs involved there. Anything further, Stuart? I think that's just covered it very well. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Jasmine. Question, another question from past District Governor Adrian. He's come out with several good ones tonight, and here's another one. We're people of action, and obviously, the more you're able to do that you enjoy, the more you're going to enjoy your Rotary. So what projects have drawn the most support from members? From... Which members of the members? Um, well, I, that's the, the question as Adrian's put it, I suppose, could be members of the whole of the, the overall Rotary South Bank or individual individual satellites. Take it as a very, I think it's a very broad question. I think it's a good one. Certainly there is a a common theme, I think, in both clubs that to take on things like homelessness and Mental health. And mental health. I mean, in our CEO club, we've even got, what's his name? Patrick Navarro. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, thanks, for that. As one of our members. So we have a lot of experience in many different walks of life. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle those topics. We had a foundation dinner a few days before our district conference. One of our speakers, one of our members from the CA club spoke at that function on homelessness. They are certainly getting involved uh, where they can. So there are quite a few projects in the pipeline and Due to the restrictions in Victoria, a lot of the projects were postponed and postponed. However, there's been a real passion and interest from both the millennial clubs and both satellite clubs, sorry, in the mental health space and in homelessness space. And initially there was lots of passion to, and a grant had been applied for by the millennials to create a specific project that was going to be very exciting. Didn't they weren't successful in that in that instance, but they're going to try again. And the focus and interest again is helping out in the homelessness space and mental health. And there was even an element of assisting people from LGBT communities, as we have a few members in our millennial club who are from that demographic and they had a passion to make a difference in that space as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Stuart. Another question from Adrian. This is a this is a uh, a reflective question. In starting these clubs, you've had this wealth of experience. So is there anything that you would do differently if you were starting it all again? Obviously, banishing COVID would be one thing. But... Yes, 100%. It has definitely <laughs> made it more challenging. And a lot of the new members hadn't even met face-to-face, you know. So it had been this full experience of meeting each other and trying to bond and create a team and create projects all in an online environment. So that was certainly challenging, especially for millennials. I think CEOs are quite used to it. But yes, would we do anything differently, Stuart? I think it's just about 
trial and error and learning and, and giving it a go and and seeing how you can do things differently and grow and yeah. then just needing to commit and, and and get on with that process and then keep learning and learning and changing things as you need to. But Stuart, what about what do you think? Exactly. I think I mean as I think I've already said, I mean the challenge with every single Rotary member is to make sure you listen and and, and you 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 give them the opportunity. I mean, I remember the day I became a Rotarian and I was tapped on the shoulder and given a job to do and I'm still doing it today. <laughs> if, if if people feel they've got a role to play, then then they will become a good Rotarian. So every club is going to be different and and, and so when the time comes, we do another club, it'll be work out who those members are and what, what they want to achieve. And I think one learning though was how much you want to balance being hands off and letting the satellite clubs or empowering and enabling them to do their own thing and how much oversight to have in that, you know, you just want to be able to pick up if you feel if someone's feeling left out or if there's some group dynamics that are changing, just how to resolve that too. Um, so I think it's probably finding a balance, especially with the millennials as to, how hands-on or how involved people are because initially it was fantastic the mentors every week and some of them felt actually we'd like them just to attend every other meeting so it's just about finding what works with that fine balance between empowering and having your own thing on your own terms that like a startup to also just having more oversight so that was probably something we learned from the process as well super thanks jasmine thanks Stuart. And this is this is a question that Every Rotary Club I know would like to get right. So one from Bruce. What process was used to attract the millennials in the beginning? Absolutely. So a few of the millennials members of our club had personally known, about maybe three. And then the other members came about from those millennials themselves. So a bit of word of mouth. And um, we certainly did share and put together some promotional material too, which we shared on social media as well. There was a the PowerPoint pack for the benefits. And um, and so, yeah, there was, a, there was a bit of referrals from, you know, existing Rotarians. Then there was referrals from the new potential satellite members and then just a wider reach. However, just... Uh, we will be definitely planning to do more of that by way of wider reach in the new year. However, we just wanted to get to a place where things were a bit more back to normal um, before growing again and we were, you know, trying to bring people on who might then feel they're unable to really fulfil the projects at this time just due to the restrictions. So it's really been a matter of, of taking your time and not getting people in who won't get a perception of full value from their participation. Absolutely. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. How does the Millennial Satellite Club relate to and work with Rotary clubs in the district? Obviously, similar age, similar age bracket. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, and obviously, the Rotary landscape has, I think, evolved over quite a number of years. I know. A number of years ago, I was down in Hobart for a Rotary conference. I went and visited the, the, Rotary, the Rotary Club of City Central Hobart. Uh, he was, is no longer there. And they were all 18 to 30-year-olds. So I've seen, I've, seen, I've seen clubs in our district trying to form Rotary clubs and having all sorts of trouble trying to do that. Once again, it comes back to to make sure that they that they feel connected to Rotary. Make sure that they've got the leadership and the and the training to help them achieve what they want to do. It allow them to do it on on their own terms, um, where possible. And and to make sure that they feel a, a part of the broader Rotary network. And that's why. Things like going along to the Rotary Convention just lets you see things that you haven't seen before. Even, everyone should be encouraged to be able to do those things. Yes, and I'll just add on that note as well, that, you know, 
everyone's attracted to different organizations for different reasons and it connects to them, it resonates with them, the cultural fit, their interests. So, you know, people interested in Rotaract, they, if these people would have been, they would have joined by now. So this was something that was more awareness, bringing awareness to them and, and kind of creating a model that suited them. And, you know, if they maybe didn't meet the mold of different types of organizations. And so this was like a standalone a startup, if you like, it gave them that ability to choose and, and chart their course. Mm. And the Millennial Satellite has encouraged people to get involved and try it. So I guess you would have had a few people try it, find it wasn't for them and, and move on, which is probably a, an endorsement of that process. Yes, yeah, there's absolutely been um, discussion to collaborate where possible with Melbourne City Rotaract. And certainly the Millennial Satellite Club will be looking at doing that in, in the future. It's been discussed many times to collaborate where possible and there might be some common interests and projects that could team up on. Okay, this is one that I've held over till, till last. So, you know, I think we will close after this one, but I'm really interested. You guys are obviously, obviously uh, keen on your, your rotary experience. You've been leaders of a very, very successful operation this year, despite the difficulties associated with you know, COVID and other things. A question for each of you. Why are you in Rotary? Well, I guess I'll, I'll go back to why I joined Rotaract in the, in the very beginning, was just to, to meet people and, and get very professional development. And then obviously I grew up through Rotary, through, through Rotaract, I went on a Rotaract Exchange trip to Japan, met lots of different ways of doing things, and then started looking at Rotary. So I started looking at my local area, didn't really find the club that really adapted to me. So then I sort of look, looked a bit further afield and found a club close to work in the city, and uh, that's where I still am today. So me, it's, it's a great opportunity to to meet, to, to help people, to, to gain skills, to support each other. Excellent. All right, so my turn. So initially I was invited to the club by President at the time, Amrit Pal Singh, and I attended a meeting. I'd heard of Rotary in the past, and I was one of those people who always wanted to join committees at uni and high school and make a change and difference and be involved, but I didn't have the fortunate experience of knowing about Rotaract or Rotary while I was um, in, you know, at that time. And so I came along to a meeting, I went along to a meeting and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the fellowship. The people were so lovely and I felt it was like a really nice, safe place that I could express myself and actually be fully myself. I was working in a legal environment at that time where I felt really confined and I felt that I really couldn't express and even um, live out aspects that I wanted to in regards to the more humanitarian aspects. And so it gave me a really a refreshing space to explore um, other interests and, and, and now it's been a wonderful experience developing more leadership experience and having this wonderful opportunity to be a president of the Rotary Club of South Bank. And so it was the fellowship aspect uh, as well as just the values of, of what Rotary stood for. I had no idea that the world's largest volunteer organisation and all the amazing projects they've done all over the world, ending polio, very close to that now. So I was really just blown away with the world of opportunity and the people, of course, and just the values and the four-way test, as I meant, um, had mentioned recently, really was something I thought, wow, this really resonates with me. And it's so wonderful to be around good people who have similar values and mindsets and that really attracted me to, to become a part of Rotary. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Stuart. That was fantastic. It's, it's, really, it's really great to sort of hear what inspires passionate Rotarians. At this stage, if you would please, join us in a round of applause for Jasmine and Stuart. <laughs> so it's absolutely fantastic. But thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thanks for your amazing question. Bye. You're for coming.